To be told that your body is a ticking time bomb it was terrifying. It's just an awful feeling knowing at any moment she could lose her life. I was getting more lumps on my back, my thighs, and my abdomen. He was devastated. We didn't know what we were going to do. Next, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. When Jessica Blazak wakes up with a sky-high fever, she suddenly finds herself facing a terrifying disease that no doctor knows how to stop. The whole thing was just surreal to me. I was very scared. I felt I pretty much could die any minute. Then, Jake Tate, a young Air Force sergeant, is at his physical peak when a series of mysterious growths appear all over his body, putting his career and life on the line. I would be in so much pain that I would literally vomit. I said, I can't live with this any longer. In the spring of 1999, 22-year-old Jessica Waxman was enjoying single life and her career as a freelance writer. And when she met health policy analyst Dave Blazak at a Baltimore nightclub, sparks flew. Dave was really cute. He was charming. He was funny. And I could just tell right away he was a good guy. I was attracted to her, and she seemed really nice. And we hit it off from there. Dave and Jessica date for the next five years. And in the fall of 2004, they get married. Soon after, they settle into a new home. The newlyweds couldn't be any happier. We like going out to parks, hanging out with our dog, just doing a lot of stuff outside. Jessica was always in good health. She never had any type of sickness. But then, one day in June of 2006, Jessica finds herself under the weather. I just felt unbelievably tired. I started to get really cold to the point where I was shivering. I've had the chills. I just thought, well, you know what? I probably have the flu. So I decided to just take some over-the-counter painkillers and just sleep it off. I became concerned when I arrived home after work. When I checked her temperature, she had a, a 105 fever. It seemed dangerously high. And I thought, we definitely need to go to the hospital. They let us in right away. They told me I was severely dehydrated and they gave me an IV. They just did basic tests and just thought I had a virus. They gave her over-the-counter fever reducing medicine and the fever went down and sent her on her way. I actually felt a little relieved that they thought it was nothing. But that night, the fevers came back. And over the next few days, her temperature continues to fluctuate. Jessica grows increasingly worried that she's been hit by something far more dangerous than a simple virus. I had a general feeling of nausea and just overwhelming sickness and fever. I probably had about 101 fever when I woke up. Around three or four o'clock in the afternoon, they would spike. They would go all the way up to 104, and it was scary. We tried over-the-counter fever-reducing medicine, but the fever kept coming back and nothing was improving. I called a doctor and he said that I needed to just try to let it run its course and I would feel better. Exhausted from the constant temperature shifts, Jessica does her best to work whenever her fever is down. But it isn't long before a disturbing new symptom sets in. I got a very bad headache. If you can picture worse than a migraine, this was it. A searing pain. In the front of my head, and in the back of my head, and over my eyes. And all I see is kind of like when somebody takes a picture, you see the flashes. I've never seen Jessica this sick before, and I felt that we had to do something. He said to me, you need to go back to the hospital. I rushed her straight to the ER. When we got to the emergency room, they could see that I was just in unbelievable amounts of pain. 
Because I was having headaches, they performed a lot of scans. They performed CTs. They performed x-rays. Every single test came back negative. And then they put her on high doses of IV antibiotics, just in case she had a bacteria or virus in her body. I was very frustrated at this point. I thought, am I going to figure out what's wrong with me? Twelve hours later, the medical team begins to suspect that Jessica has meningitis, an inflammation of the protective membranes that cover the spinal cord. It can be caused by a virus or bacteria and may be fatal. Meningitis was considered a possibility because of the headaches and the fever. This was the first time that I thought, oh my God, I could have something really serious. The thought of her possibly having meningitis was very unsettling to us and upsetting. They wanted to perform a spinal tap to find out if she definitely had meningitis. The whole thing was just surreal to me. I was very scared. We had to wait several hours for the results from the doctor. It was very nerve-wracking. I was very worried but it was negative, and it was a big relief that she didn't have meningitis. But it felt like we were back to square one and didn't know what was wrong with her. The antibiotic was helping. The fever was still there, but it wasn't as bad. I think it was probably around 101, and my headaches were gone. So they said, okay, well, you're stable. You seem to be getting better. We'll send you home. I was pretty frustrated at that point. I knew I needed a second opinion. I saw an infectious disease doctor two days after our hospital visit. Jessica walks her through everything she's experienced over the past three weeks. And after performing a thorough exam, the doctor comes to a startling conclusion. It was very surprising to me. They thought I had leptospirosis. Leptospirosis is a rare infection caused by Leptospira, a bacteria found in fresh water that's been contaminated by animal urine. Leptospirosis did make sense, because Dave and I did go kayaking a couple weeks before I got sick. The doctor immediately orders a blood test. And three tense hours later, the findings come in negative for Leptospirosis. Baffled, she consults with her team, and soon after suggests an even more alarming possibility. She thought it might be cancer. And that's when things got really scary. Some of her symptoms did match up with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. She was having night sweats. She had spikes in the fever. My mom passed away from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it brought back a whole lot of memories that were very unpleasant. The fact that cancer is now a possibility terrified us. Over the past three weeks, 30-year-old Jessica Blazak has been suffering from extremely high fevers and overwhelming fatigue. Despite performing multiple tests, her doctors aren't sure what's going on. But now, one specialist has dropped a bombshell. Jessica may have cancer. They did a blood test to see her white blood cell count. Also, they did a full body PET scan that would highlight if there was any type of cancerous tumors within her body. They give you an IV. It's a radioactive fluid that um, courses through your veins. And then they just scan your body. And after the test, you're so scared to hear the result. It was absolutely agonizing and we couldn't wait till the actual results came back. We talked about how this could affect us, what could happen if I did have cancer, you know, what we would do, and we deal day by day with what happens. They let me know the next day that I did not have cancer. To hear that was an absolute relief. It was a huge weight off my shoulders, huge. But we were very frustrated that we weren't getting any answers and nobody could figure out why she is having these type of symptoms. As the days went on, I felt worse. I had muscle aches. The 
constant feeling of sickness, of nausea, of weakness. I felt I couldn't catch my breath sometimes. Even worse, her temperature keeps fluctuating. When the fever would spike to 105, I would get super cold. And I'd have to just go under the covers and try to just get warm again. And then when my fever would break, I would get very hot. So it was a cycle. The fever was taking a toll on her daily activities, and she was spending a lot of time in bed, sweating and bundled up. You feel helpless. You feel like there's nothing you can do. After having 105 fevers every day, it gets to the point where like, you're thinking, geez, am I gonna wake up tomorrow? It's just really scary. Desperate to help Jessica, Dave devotes himself to researching doctors and soon comes across a highly respected internist he thinks his wife should meet, Dr. Abby Mae Miller. Jessica first went to see Dr. Miller about three weeks after she was released from the hospital. When I went to see Dr. Miller, my fever was probably around 104. I ran a fever all day long. I first met Jessica about four weeks into her illness. It was very concerning that Jessica had a fever for as long as she had. Typically, viral illnesses will run their course within 10 days to two weeks. So I started to look up what are the potential causes for such a long fever. I thought it could be adult onset Stills disease. Stills disease is an autoimmune disease, meaning that you make antibodies um, to a part of your body. It's similar to rheumatoid arthritis um, that children get, but it occurs in older patients. They oftentimes will have a characteristic salmon-colored rash when they have a fever. Jessica did not have the characteristic rash, but she had the other criteria. Headaches, high fevers that are daily fevers, and the diagnosis of Stills disease is made by having two of the most common criteria, and she did meet those criteria, but part of um, diagnosing Stills disease is making sure that the person doesn't have some other form of infection. She wanted to be 100% sure that this was the right diagnosis. Well, the ferritin test, which was the test for Stills disease, was slightly elevated, but it wasn't anywhere near as high as it should have been if she had Stills disease. Dr. Miller called Jessica and told her that she doesn't have adult onset Stills disease. I was unsettled. It was just really scary, and I was getting a little depressed over it. I've never seen a patient with such a persistent fever before. The fever itself isn't so dangerous, but most of the causes for a fever that persists can be dangerous. So I wanted to repeat her blood cultures. But the findings shake Jessica to the core. A couple days later, I got a call from Dr. Miller. She goes, this could be very serious. You have bacteria in your blood. Bacteria in the blood can cause a syndrome called sepsis, and Jessica ended up septic. So I recommended that she go immediately to the emergency room. Sepsis is a serious bacterial infection in the bloodstream. If left untreated, it can result in death. I was pretty freaked out. We didn't really know how to feel, but we knew that whatever we had to do, it needed to be done fast. When I was rushing to the hospital, it was surreal. Dr. Miller met us at the hospital. Um, we were admitted immediately. They treated me with high doses of antibiotics, very high doses. As soon as I got on the antibiotics, my fever was reduced, 101, as opposed to 104. But while Dr. Miller tries to get the life-threatening sepsis under control, she finds herself grappling with an entirely new problem. I did another physical exam, and she had a very loud heart murmur and that was different than previous exams. It can be associated with some serious heart problems. A heart murmur is an irregularity in the heartbeat. It can be a sign of infection, disease, or valve problem, any of which can prove fatal. 